All right, let's get started. So this definitely will help you understand the code. But it's not the only solution to it. Okay, you can see there are a lot of balancing robots on the market you can buy. Uh, they may have all different uh, algorithms running behind the scene. But I mean, let's just get the ta uh, the first, uh, the part one has how many tasks? Like eight tasks, uh, no, four tasks. Get that done so you can understand how to uh, access the bottom level registers of the of the sensor. Okay. So first thing you need to know is the gyroscope data. So the LSB data, does that LSB data have a unit? How many bits does it have in the memory on the MPU 6050? So the result has how many bits? Sixteen, right? You have to get A first and then shift it to the left and then combine another A. And eventually you got a sixteen bit LSB, you know, the that many LSBs. And does that number have a unit or not? Yes, LSB. That's how many LSBs. So how can I convert it into the uh, angular velocity? I have to look at the data here. So it is, after you get the gyroscope's raw data, for example, we are using the first one, we uh, gave the FS underscore cell select a zero value. So it's going to pick up the sensitivity of 131 LSBs per that angular velocity. All right, so you have to look at the entire thing here, the angular velocity, that entire thing as one entity, and then use how many LSPs to divide, uh, divide that many LSPs by this number. No, uh, yeah, yeah, divide that by this number. So the, uh, the way to do that is, <clears throat> sorry, of, First thing to clar clarify <laughs> zero uh, row data as how many LSPs you are getting from the sensor, and that one is how many LSPs, right? And to convert it into angular velocity, which is um, zero rho over 131 LSB per degree per second. So that's the angular velocity you are trying to get. And that's a LSB number. So do this division to find out the, you know, how many degrees per second. And because the loop is uh, using uh, four milliseconds all the time, so that's why if you want to want to calculate for uh, that change, because it's making it's reading for one general data every four milliseconds. Okay, if there's a change, if there's a change, if there's no change, then what's going to happen? If it's not turning at all. It's just like staying there. Have you tried that? If you, it's not moving, just put it like even there's an angle, it should be zero. Have you have you tried that? So it has to move. It's a dynamic data. I have to read it when, whenever it's moving. And so that's where you can get angle value because, for example, this is A degrees per second. And the way to convert it into degrees is just use A times <clears throat> 0 0.004 seconds because the unit here is per second and this is um, for many seconds so to get the degrees how many degrees delta degrees right and the second one you know what I want to talk about is the gyroscope data uh, drifts over time because it's calculating for delta degree 
So the delta degree can happen here. Um, or it has, can happen here. Okay. It's going to read the same data if the degree, delta degree is the same. Cannot tell the difference. So that's why we need a accelerometer's data as well at the same time. The third one, um, let's see what you need to know. Okay, so the the interrupt. Okay, if you haven't learned that yet, have to be serious about it. it can be a little bit confusing. Let's go to the interrupts. So the way that it rotates the wheel uh, is during the interrupt. And that one is 20 microseconds. So every 20 microseconds is going to run the interrupt the survey routine. Um, so here's how I'll set up the interrupt. And the first parameter here is not part of it. It's the frequency of the I2C communication protocol. So it's 400 kilohertz. And how do we know it's 400 kilohertz? That's the register you want to write. You want to write a 12 in there. And how to calculate it? I think it's down here. OK, so that's the register. You can directly use the name of it in your sketch. And you then directly just assign a 12 into it. So let's see how the 12 is calculated. So the uh, clock frequency of the I2C communication. So the CPU clock frequency divided by all these things. And two times, if you assign this number to 12, you can do the calculation, it's going to be 24 over here. So 16 plus 24 times per scatter values. So I have to find out what the per scatter is being used over here. And what is that? So prescalar value is from here. You can read it from TWI. So what does TWI mean? So whenever, you know, it's an I2C protocol, right? Whenever you are looking at I2C, you have wired everything up on the breadboard. Remember, you have ICL, you have SDA. How many wires? Two. That's why usually whenever you see something related to I2C, it's going to be TW. It's a two-wire thing. So WI, I think, is two-wire interface. Um, and TWBR is, is a two-wire bit rate or something like that. I mean, it's or baud rate register, you know, whatever. So TW is two, OK? Um, the, you have. So what's the CPU clock frequency of the Atomega 322P chip on the Arduino board? What's the frequency? Common sense, okay, guys, come on. What's the crystal oscillation frequency? Keep in mind, 16 megahertz, okay? It's like whenever people are asking you in the interview, like, what's the voltage of the USB cable? Five volts. If it's a USB, it doesn't matter what's the shape. It's like can be a standard USB, can be a micro USB, can be a any kind of USB. As long as it's called USB, universal bus, serial, it's gonna be five volts anywhere, right? You are thinking like you are powering up your USB 32 with 0.3 volts. How that works? If you probe the USB power pin on the USB cable. There, there is a little thing wire printed on the on the field. You just find out that one from the port and probe it. It's going to be five volts. And on the ESP32, it has a three point three volts regulator. So that's why you are getting three point three. So five volts being regulated to three point three is perfect. The dropout voltage is only like one point seven volts. So not um, so the regulators are not uh, not perfect. Um, you cannot use like three point five volts to get the 3.3 volts, because none of the regulators can do that. 0.2 volts dropout voltage. <laughs> it's very difficult. 
So I have done 0 0.4 volts drop power voltage, and there's a little tiny chip. Um, I forgot the name, but we have been using that in our uh, 351 microcontroller class. So a very, very low drop power voltage. How low? 0 0.4 volts. So we can use a 0 0.7 volts one cell LiPo battery to power up a 3.0 volts microcontroller. All right, very practical problem. Remember that. 0 0.4 volts is still doable. 0 0.2 volts, impossible. From 5 volts to 0 0.3 volts, easy. I got 1.7 volts rule to drop. All right, easy. So that's why USB 5 volts regulated to 0 0.3 volts, easy. And the CPU clock frequency of the Arduino board is 16 megahertz. Common sense, you need to know that. Okay? So that's why I directly plug in the number over here, 16 mega. All right, 16 million. You can directly use 16 million. All right. And you know this number because that's what you assigned to the variable. Okay. And then Prisker value. Sorry, I was wrong. So TSBR. Okay, TSBR. So I type it wrong here. TS TWSR. Sorry, that should be TWBR, right? A little typo. Um so we have no we know that this is 16 megahertz, this is 16, this is 12, and the per square value right now is one. How do we know it's one? See here, I just mentioned it's one. How do we set up one here? How do we know the per scatter is one? See, the per scatter is determined by the TWI register. It's an A bit register, and just below, right below it. So TWI, it's an A bit register, can host A bits. So all the other ones by default, if you do not change it, it's going to be zero. So all the other ones are zeros. If I want to make a one here, what you want to put in there? If you put a one, the prescriber becomes four, right? Put the table. Is it correct? So if you set up, see, look at this, TWS, TWPS, TWPS for the last two bits. If they are zero, zero, then the prescaler value is one. So which means you can directly put a one here for the prescaler. If these two bits, like a decoder, right? If you have a different code to set up different values. And if you put a zero, one there, then it's gonna give a four to the prescaler. And because we are not actually assigning any numbers to this TWI, did I do that? If you look at the code, did I do like something equal assigned to, to, to TWI? Did you see that? No, I didn't, right? So by default, if you do not write into any registers to configure it, the default value is always zero. Not just for Arduino microcontrollers, also for PIC. It's in, in the old days, not actually pick is not really old. Pick is very popular for, for my generation. And old means like these um, 8051s were the, the, from Intel. The people are still were stealing, coding them with assembly. Like I mentioned, right? Takes two hours to just blink an LED. So, so pick Arduino's, so pick is from a uh, microchip. And microchip acquired at Mega Atmel a couple of years ago. So now actually our Arduino, the whole company, is owned by uh, microchip, which is the biggest company making microcontrollers on this planet. All right. So it's very common. So uh, for peak microcontrollers, for Arduino microcontrollers, for ESP microcontrollers, if you do not configure anything, the default values are all zeros. All right. Keep in mind. I didn't set up TWI, so that's why it's gonna, the per is going to be uh, a zero, uh, one. 
And if you plug in all the numbers, you can calculate the I2C frequency, and it becomes 400K. Uh, it doesn't have to be 400K, but 400K works pretty well. So that's probably why people want to use 400K. If you change it a little bit, like change it from 400K to 420K, definitely it's going to be it's going to work the same way. Not going to change anything, right? Okay. So now let's look at the uh, the interrupt. So why do we need an interrupt? Let's think about this from the bigger picture. It's a very common problem in the microcontroller control system, right? Why do we need an interrupt? Let me give you another example I worked uh, two years ago for a Cosa Springs resort, hot tubs. It's gonna stay there for the whole, whole winter. Hotels, hot tubs, and buffet. So I got a panel, has one, two, three, four, seven segment display. All right. So how do we display a number of four numbers on this display panel? So every seven segment display has seven LEDs, right? Have you played with seven segment display in the past? Can you just connect every single LED to one GPL so you can control four times seven, which is 28 LEDs using the GPLs on Arduino. So take all, you don't even have enough number of pins to control that. How to do it, how to do it. How to display a number at the same time, static number, like one, two, three, four, how to do that? Using one microcontroller, not two, not three. There's a selector, right? You select this guy, and then jump to this guy, select this guy, select this guy, select this guy, one by one. You select it, you'll send a number to it. You select the second one, you'll send a number to it. Select the third one, send a number to it. Select the first one, send a number to it. You do it very quickly, right? It's gonna cheat cheat your eyes. You couldn't resolve it. It's like <clears throat> scanning all the time. So, oh, it's static. Actually, it's not. Your eye cannot resolve anything higher than 10 frames per second, or 15 probably. If our Superman, probably 30 frames per second. But anyway, anyway so this is how, how that works. So the my controller has a loop function, right? So the loop function is very busy. It's gonna loop through these selections, <clears throat> scanning, and at the same time, assign a number to it. Scanning, assign a number to it. Very, very busy, all right? But you only have one microcontroller, one core. How can I sense the data at the same time? I want to sense the temperature and display it to the panel, right? I mean, you are thinking, hey, I can sense it. How? I can just uh, display, select the first one, select the first one, and then I'm going to do the temperature sensing. And I'm going to scan the second one, then third one, then fourth one. So I'm going to I just plug in that temperature sensing in, in, in here so I can up the temperature. What's the problem? It has different intervals. So the display looks awful. It's not static anymore. That's the final effect. Okay, It's not working really well. So what you can do? There are many ways to do it. Interrupt is one of the ways. Okay? And you do not take that much time. You take that 20 microseconds break evenly. It's not like just plugging to here. No. I just take that time evenly. And I, whenever it's doing all this display scanning, I just break very shortly compared to the display scanning. It's very, very slow. And take that little break to sense the temperature and come back. And then you cannot tell, your eyes cannot tell. So that's one of the ways you want to do the, um, one of the application you want to use 
interrupt. So when you are handling, like, for example, when I'm handling, when I'm teaching, right? When I'm teaching right now, I'm talking. So I'm actually checking your response every 20 microseconds. <laughs> I'm looking at your response. They are not listening. These guys are like doing their own stuff. They're not paying attention. I'm kidding. No, you can do whatever. <laughs> so I'm checking, right? So I'm checking so I can get some feedback and see if, if I'm just talking something like really boring, right? So you need to take interrupt. Uh, I don't have one brain. I don't have multiple cores. So I have to do that, right? Interrupt them. I'm back. That's how that works. You can do several interrupts in the microcontroller system if you have only one loop, one core. Scanning the core, but jumping out from the core, from the loop, and do something else and come back all the time, all right? Which is fine, which works. And sometimes you have multiple interrupts, like the first level one, the second level one, it takes, um, you can assign priority to these interrupts, respond to which one first. So which means like it's running this loop, interrupt, do this, check. And during that interrupt, <laughs> there is another interrupt. So what's happening is if it's running in the loop, it has so many levels of interrupts. You know, sometimes the programmer cannot handle it. The engineer cannot really handle it. Okay. Whenever you are watching a TV, you are still moving your mouse, trying to, you know, purchase something online on Amazon, right? How, how that works. Definitely, yeah, you have multi-core on your computer, but it has to be handled by an operating system. So it's doing this real-time system application. You know, it's taking different time frames to do which. Like, you, for example, I just simply moving my mouse from here to here, right? It looks like smooth because your eye cannot resolve it. It's not smooth at all. It was done by several different little time frames. And you put them together, it's like a smooth move, move, movement. Why is that has to be like that? It's also displaying this camera's video. It's streaming everything. It's going, it's um, you know, streaming data from the Wi-Fi from the router. So how that works? Have multiple tasks, right? It only do one task during that, like for example, one milliseconds for the operating system. Okay. And then, since time is just one dimension, right? I do this during this one macro, one milliseconds, and the macro, the next one milliseconds, I'm gonna do the second task, and then so on and so forth. So you are kind of like have several one milliseconds to do just a part of each task, but because the computer can run in like three gigahertz, right? So it's going to complete all these things, even though it's just doing one thing, it's not completing that thing, right? For example, I'm moving my hand from here to here. One milliseconds, right? And then it takes the time to do something else right now. And then whenever it's done, so the task five is done, comes back, take another one milliseconds to move my hand to the other position. And then same for the task two, it's just doing another part of task two. Let's keep doing that. And then come back, right? Because it, it is able to do that really fast. So it seems like I'm done this movement smoothly, but actually it's not. It's taking all these discrete time frames. That was done by a, a operating system which can handle many tasks. But for our single core one dollar microcontroller, we have to use interrupts. So uh, the the where we are using the interrupts over here for the car. I mean, think about it. You can, you can use the interrupt to do the PID calculation, which is not recommended because the PID calculation has what? Differential, has multiplication, has all the addings. So what's the most expensive operation in computer system? or what's the most time consuming? Divisions, multiplications, it takes a lot of time. So for the core algorithm or the computation, which is the PID controller, you definitely don't want to put in the, in, in, in the interrupt. It takes too much time. 
It's not interrupt. It's like a main task. <laughs> Boom, interrupt for a year. <laughs> Sometimes, if you compare to that time, probably that time is a year, right? So what do you want to put in the interrupt? Think about that. You're doing doing one whole thing here. Definitely want to put the PID controller in there. So it's calculating the angle. So that's one loop. And to interrupt and do something and then come back. So what's that thing? Should be whenever it's adjusting the angle. When the car is adjusting the angle. Another question, why do we have to use interrupt for the car application? How long it takes to run entire loop for our definition right now? Four milliseconds, all right? It takes a lot of time to get the PID controller's value, and you don't want to just use one loop, because every time it runs one loop, you assign one step to the stepper motor, and you don't want to take the whole loop to just do one adjustment. It's too late. It's already tipping over. It's too late. So you have to break, adjust, come back, calculate, break, adjust. All right. No, the PID calculation is in the main loop. So you have how long for the main loop? A quick quiz, quiz question. You guys have to understand this first before you modify it, right? So how long is the main loop? Where, where is that one? That's in part one. So last time um, on Wednesday, we talked about that, right? Remember? Yeah, this can be tricky. This is not like a trivial Arduino harvest <laughs> application. I can tell you, I mean, I didn't, I didn't design this, pro this uh, algorithm. I referred to that, that person's uh, algorithm. And I understood everything afterwards. I simplified it into a like three times shorter version, but just balancing everything on the table. Since I'm, I have to teach you. I don't want to just show you the like three pages of code, an original author. Then you got frustrated. It's just eventually you couldn't get it work, and then just directly like, copy and paste. Not making sense, right? Um. So how long is the main loop? How long the main loop takes? Remember, four milliseconds, four milliseconds. So what's actually happening here is, it can be frustrating, but you have to take your time to, to stare at it, to stare at the code, to let your brain run for a time, for some time, right? Just, mm, oh, that's why. You wanna wait for that aha moment. So it takes, let me write it on the board. That's a loop function, the beginning of the loop function. So this is the time scale, all right? For example, it takes this much time to get a PID value, PID output. How? Refer to the code, pretty simple, straightforward. You get an angle change. As long, so that's why I split everything into different tasks. Right, so I know stuff over there, but you know, after we are done, we you know how to calculate the angles, then we can move to the next task. But you, you have to know like how to get the angle first, so you can find the angle errors. Because the angle error is the angle right now minus zero. So here's a zero degree. All right, so to find out the angle error, then it becomes easy because you just directly use the equation. The PID controller's equation, very simple. I mean, if you don't know how to do it, it's already in the code. I already showed you. 
and look at it on the three lines, three lines, you know, just type it in your, in your uh, EAD file file in the window. Very easy, all right? You get an angle, you get an angle difference of the error, and you plug into the PID controller, and you can find out the PID output, okay? That takes time, but fine. I mean, the my controller probably will take like less than one minute seconds to calculate PID out. Okay, that's okay, all right? Then what's gonna happen is, the entire loop function, that's the end of the loop function, it takes how long for the entire loop function? I'm asking this question again, I mean, how long? Four milliseconds, right? Why do we want to use a fixed time period, not, not like that one varying? You have to, you know, make a fixed delta t. For the gyroscope data, it's changing how many degrees per second, right? That first reason, and second reason is I mean, just think about that. Like, why do we have to use four milliseconds, right? And it's definitely longer than whatever it uh, it needs to calculate the PID output. So you still have a lot of time left. So that time is being used to adjust the angle of the car. So it's taking 20 microseconds breaks. And every time, it only adjusts the position for how many times? So 20 microseconds. Depends on the PID value, right? Depends on how, if the, if the number is big, it's way off from the zero degree, it probably takes more iterations to, to make it back to, you know, zero. All right. So, again, this is not the only solution. This is just a solution from the original author. I'm just, just trying to understand it right now. It works. So, <clears throat> we have an angle here. If it's going, moving, uh, tipping forward, falling forward, and we need to roll this wheel in that direction to adjust the position. So actually the input will be the angle difference, which is the error, and processed by the PID controller to get your PID out. And you're using that PID controller and convert it, you know, there's another transfer function here, and convert, convert it into how many steps you want to roll the wheel. Right, if the angle is big, you want to roll the wheel for more steps. So here's why we want to use we want to use stepper motors. I mean, let me just ask you a really simple question: Why do we use that high quality stepper motor instead of the the crap DC motor you used in your ESP32 camp car? What's the difference? Yeah, one is twenty dollar, one is one dollar. <laughs> But why do we do we want to use stepper motor? But I mean, if you can you can buy a five dollar stepper motor as well. But you definitely want to use stepper motor for this accurate control. For the ESP32, the car is just like a three year old kid just running in the in the room freely. Sometimes you want to move the car straight forward. It's running straight for a while, then start turning left, turning left, turning right. Why? Because you apply the same voltage to the two motors. It runs at a, at a different rate. It's a DC motor, it's analog. It's not accurate, it depends on the quality of the coils. I mean, different different vendors has different, even the same batch, probably they have different qualities or gaps or something, right, for the coils. So that's why you apply the same voltage, the DC motor rotates at a different rate, which is awful. How can you control a 
balancing robot car using that crap DC motor. It's very difficult. So that's why I want to use stepper motor, right? Because you give a step, it's going to run, it's going to roll for one step. And how many steps the DC, the stepper motor uh, has in the lab? So the, 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 the uh, stepper motor in our lab, how many steps it has for, 30, uh, for 330 degree? Did you look at the data sheet for that data? That's critical, okay? So that's why I'm, I'm not just giving you guys the, you, you need to think about why, not just, uh, you know, following the tutorial, which is good, and you know, follow is great. So think about that. Actually, the stepper motor we are using divides the 360 degree into 200 divisions. It's 1.8 degree per step. It's very accurate. You're thinking like 1.8 degree, how accurate it is? Is that like 1.85, 1.9, 1.75? Is that possible? No, it's not possible, like a gear, it's like a gear, right? It has, a, that's, has 200 teeth. It's not a gear, but I'm just saying, after 200 steps, it's gonna come back to the origin. Exactly, no doubt, it's digital, right? I give a pulse, it's gonna run for one step, and that step will be exactly 1.8 degrees. That's awesome, that's why I wanna use stepper motors, right? They are thinking like, hey, one step is too small, like only 1.8 degrees? Is that making any difference? Think about that, you can use a digital system to give pulses, a series of pulses really quickly. So make one step, two step, it's already 3.6 degrees, and times three, times four, right? If you do it quickly, it's an analog move. It's not digital anymore, right? So actually not making any differences. So that's why all the uh, industry robot arms, like, like doing the welding, doing the controlling, you know, in the, in the car uh, factory, it has to be stepper motor, cannot be any type of other types of motor. It has to be super accurate. Whenever I'm welding that point on that Toyota Tundra, it has to be that point. It cannot be like I'm welding the, the, the door, it's like welding the wheel. It would be a um, awful accident, right? So <clears throat> the purpose of the code is to convert that angle error into how many steps you want to roll the stepper motor. Straightforward, but how? Right, that's the purpose of the algorithm. Any questions? So let's come back to the algorithm. Yeah, we still have to look at the interrupt first. <laughs> so before we go to the PID calculation, let's focus on this one first. So interrupt is handled by a timer, by a timer, counter, okay? Because you want to interrupt every 20 microseconds, that's why you need a timer when the timer is up, interrupt. Right, 20 microseconds. It can be longer, can be shorter, but now we are using 20 microseconds, which works. It doesn't have to be 20 microseconds. If you do 40, 30, I think it's gonna work as well. So the, uh, when you are setting up the interrupt, right, you are setting up how long it's gonna take that interrupt. First, second, you can choose do we want to use a timer to do the interrupt, or do we want to use the external signal to do the interrupt? Okay. Do you have any ideas about any implications regarding that? Timer is fine. Like I'm designing a, a temperature monitor for 
for the Pocosa Spring hot tub. Nobody cares. Like when you interrupt and pro and uh, acquire the uh, temperature sensor data and display and come back and do display, right? Nobody cares. You just do it evenly, twenty micro. You know, usually like one milliseconds interrupt, and that works perfectly. Nobody cares. Like one millisecond is too too short. You want to do two milliseconds, right? And just like the the water temperature probably not changing every two seconds, right? It's not changing at all. So in that case, it's just directly just directly deploy all these sensors uh, on the resort. It's gonna work perfectly. So when do you need an external interrupt? To trigger it. What about thermostat? I don't know, I'm just thinking like, what about the thermostat? Can we design a thermostat that, that is triggered by a low temperature below the set point, then so that one is going to trigger that interrupt. It's not a good application, no. <laughs> We're making this too complicated. It can be a super thermostat, it's easy, right? Let's don't use that. Any other things? I mean, I'm just thinking like in the industry, if the robot arm is, is failing and that failure is detected by a sensor, Right, and the sensor is gonna send a signal to do an interrupt. So stop, don't do that anymore. Stop, and then do a calibration. All right, it doesn't have to do a one millisecond calibration all the time because usually it, it won't fail for two hours. So only it only needs to do that calibration whenever. I don't, I'm not saying it's 100% accurate. For example, the arm is not doing a, we have a, a plus minus 2% error tolerance, right? So it's like 98% accurate. Whenever it's 90, 97%, then hey, let's interrupt and calibrate and then come back. Now, nobody knows when it's gonna happen. It just depends, right? So in that case, you need an external signal to trigger it. So all the microcontrollers has a mechanism to do it. You have to configure the uh, some of the, so you can see that there are quite a few registers you can you can configure. It's like a eight bit memory banks. You just plug in different battery numbers in there to set up that uh, function module to be operating in which mode. Can be external trigger, can be internal trigger, can be timer trigger, can be whatever. Can be how long to trigger it. All these kind of parameters are being set up by these registers, which are uh, one byte memory banks, all right? So what's the first one? TCCR2A. Let's scroll down. Wait, um, TCCR two A is what? Oh, here. Timer counter two, so you can expect that there's a timer counter one as well. It's you know, a microcontroller, commercial microcontroller is just being versatile, so it has multiple timers and counters. And <clears throat> timer counter. I don't know what does that mean, CR to B, whatever. So that's uh, to B, and we are using to A. Like, let's see, which is where is the to A one? Did you see to A somewhere further down? This one? Doesn't like the one I saw a couple of days ago. I was trying to, oh, this one, right? So what's the value? I think I, I gave a, a, to, a zero to it. So zero to it means all the, all the I cleared it out, I, I reset it. 
but eventually I still have to give a value to it. So these are just clearing out these, just trying to reset these registers. So if they are being set by a different value in, in another function, I just want to reset it before I uh, move things over. So TCCRB, uh, TCCR2B is there as well. And what does this mean? I mean, this is confusing in Arduinos, but that's how, how that works. I mean, this, uh, the, the PIC programming, uh, it's like the, it's a bit assignment. So in PIC, it's way more straightforward, but here it's not really straightforward. Um, have you ever seen that in the past? No, you guys? Okay, so this, so look at this one first, OCIE2A. So what is that? What's the value for that one? OCIE2A, where is that? Here, okay. So OCIEA, I know there's no tool, but the thing is, um, the data sheet and the real architecture is a little bit different. I think there's a typo for the data sheet, or they just directly give you a, a general name for it. It's not uh, give you a specific number two over here. So you have to use the OCIE2A. It's uh, trying to denote the, the second um, mask register. So this one is at uh, bit two, bit one. So whenever you have a one here, it's, an, it's so this is number two. So what you can treat that thing here is the two. Is that two or one? Sorry, one. So it's a one. So OCIE2A, if you replace that number with a one, it's gonna be the same result. It's just trying to confuse you. So it's telling you that OCIE2A is being set as one. So that's the whole point for this one. So how that works. So it's um, so that's the entire register has a bit, a bits, sorry. And what is this? Just one. So what is one in the memory? That's one. Left shift by one. What's the value? I, I'm not two, sorry, one. Because OCIEA is one. OCIE 2A is bit one. See, it's one. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm saying it's confusing. So if you replace OCIE 2A with one, it's gonna work uh, for the code as well. It's not changing anything, any result. All right, so I'm not looking for it. Okay, so just imagine that this thing here, this variable is nothing but a one. So this one, which is seven zeros, in the front and one being shifted to the left by one bit. So you are getting this. Okay. And then it is doing an OR operation and then assign the result to this register itself. So if you look at registers, uh, uh, team SK2, right? I already passed it. Here. That's the register, team SK2. If I have all zeros and one zero to or whatever in there, I don't care. What's going to happen? It's going to set this bit to one. Is that correct? So you're asking, hey, you already use OCIEA as one. That's a different thing. I mean, OCIEA, that variable, that variable is just a variable. That variable in Arduino is one, just a one. But now we are doing something for the whole register. It's an eight-bit register. That OCIE is one bit. It's a second bit from the right. I want to set that bit to one. 
That's the whole point of that line. It's confusing. I mean, it's better. I mean, I can tell you um, in other microcontrollers how that works. Okay, if you look at this thing. So what if I have T team SK2 dot OCIEA? So that's a register, that's a that single bit of the register, and I assign a one to it. What about that? Do you like it? I just want to set this bit to one. Come on. That's a register, that's a bit, that's that single bit of this register. I just want to set a one to it. This looks way better, right? That's in the old uh, C programming with the pick my controllers. And now in Arduino, it's a different format. You have to do it like this. Okay, you didn't know that, but now learn it. Just in the future, just whenever you want to set up, you want to set, not set up, sorry. You want to set this bit to one. You don't have to know where that bit is in the register, right? You just need to write down the name of it. It contains the, the location of the bit. So OCIE2A is one. So you just use a constant one and shift by how many bits, then or that original register, then it's gonna set this bit in that register to one, that's it. Just remember it. Don't ask why and also don't diss it. I mean, it's, this was designed in the system, okay? Same for this one. So if you look at the code, you will understand why you have to set CS21, that bit in the two CC, uh, TCRR2P21. Let's see. Why do you have to set up this one to, to one? Did I make it one here? Yes. So that's TCCR2B. That's another controlling another thing here. And I, I'm giving a one to it, which means the last, so how many bits are there in this CS2, CS2 uh, control number there? Three bits, okay? So if I give a one to it, what's gonna happen? So what are the three bits? Zero, zero, one. So look at it. Zero, zero, do we have zero, zero, one? By default, so this can be, you know, you can treat it as default, right? Whatever it can be one, can be zero. Right? But we're not using that, I guess. So do we assign a two to it? What's the number do we assign to it? CS21. CS21. Is that weird? CS2, one, <laughs> right? You are setting that bit. CS2, one, it has a typo. Um, that's ridiculous, like CA22, CA21, CS20. <laughs> I have to correct it manually. Never mind. So CS21, set it. This is picking up the clock prescaler as eight. So it's dividing the clock by eight times. And then you can use the equation to calculate for the, so prescaler is over here, it's two times n. So n right now, we picked up a. So it's two times eight times one plus OCR and x. That's another number we set up. Um, I think we use the 39. Why do we use 39? Because we want this one to be 20 microseconds. So you use that equation, you plug 20 microseconds over here, it has to be 40 microseconds, why? Whenever you are using a 20 microseconds, the period has to be 40 microseconds. There's another thing is confusing. Keep in mind, I'm recording, so I think you guys can come back and, and, and watch if you 
to understand it. So it's defined by the Mac controller was that was from the digital uh, designer on the team. Okay, so whenever this one flips, it's going to trigger an interrupt. Doesn't matter the rising edge or falling edge. So that's why 20 microseconds is going to trigger interrupt. Another 20 microseconds is going to trigger another interrupt. Okay, so totally the period of this signal is internal signal, the OCN signal. The period will be 40 microseconds if you want to trigger the interrupt of every 20 microseconds. That's why you plug in this one is 1 over 40 microseconds. Okay, and then you plug 8 over here, and on the top is a crystal oscillator's frequency, which is 16, micro, uh, 16 megahertz. And you can calculate for this number you want to use, which becomes 39. So if you plug in a 39 over here, then it's going to give a 20 microseconds interrupt every time, every 20 microseconds. Is that interesting? So let's look at the code. That's the last thing I want to talk about. So see here? Just give a 39 to it. It's going to interrupt the every 20 microseconds. You can modify it if you want to interrupt every 30 microseconds, and I don't think it's going to make any difference. It's going to work. All right, but don't like make 2,000 microseconds, right? So, you know, that will work. You only have four, four milliseconds, and you are, you are interrupting just twice. That doesn't have enough time to adjust it. All right? Okay, so I think we have done a lot of uh, most of the important ones, and I guess we still need to meet on Monday to talk about the PID thing, which is the core algorithm of the controller. And then you guys are ready to, to work on that. And I hope uh, we can get everything done this semester. So if three weeks is not enough, I'm going to use another week to get it done. We uh, Since last semester, I got feedback from students. They, they were wondering like if we can I uh, use the uh, entire semester to just do the balancing car. I was thinking like this is too long. But now three weeks may be a bit short. Um, if we have to, we, we, we want to get a product out of it instead of rushing. Okay? All right, we'll see you on Monday.